Great, thank you, Charmian. Uh, so just to recap, uh, welcome everyone to the fifth Sunday conversation of 2023 presented by the Massachusetts ME, CFS, and FM Association, also known as Mass ME. Uh, today's program is titled Using Wearable Technology to Measure and Manage Long COVID and ME CFS. Uh, I'm Helma Gunnigal. I'm a proud volunteer of Mass ME, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's event. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to our Mass ME members. Your membership makes it possible for the organization to host and sustain these Sunday conversation support groups, patient services, and more. And if you'd like to learn more about how membership helps the organization or to become a member, please visit our website at massmecfs.org slash join. Uh, so before we begin uh, with the talk today with Harry, uh, we'd like to note that Visible is not the only app available to patients, but it is notable in that it is developed primarily for making tracking and measuring of your day-to-day -day health variations easier. So no more paper journals. And if you use a different app that you like, uh, please, we encourage you to put that in the chat so that others can benefit from the choices and possibly find the tool that is best for them. Uh, so to introduce today's speaker, Harry, uh, he's a former engineer that has worked at multiple early stage startups in Silicon Valley, as well as in Formula One. And he founded uh, the company Visible an activity tracking platform for long COVID and MECFS as a result of his own health condition and aims to use the platform to help increase our understanding of complex chronic illness. Uh, in this edition of Sunday Conversations, Harry will speak with us and fill us in on the Visible app and where it's headed. So thank you so much, Harry, for joining us today. Uh, and please take it away with your presentation. Awesome, thank you very much, Helen. Let me just um, share the correct screen. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan, for that for that introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm Harry. I'm the CEO and founder of Visible. Um, as Alan mentioned, I've spent my career in the tech industry, uh, designing and scaling um, tech products for startups in Silicon Valley. Uh, and really, my entry into healthcare has been via my health condition. So I've had long COVID for two and a half years now. Um, but it's, it's also been something that I've been intimately familiar with for a while, in a sense. So my stepmom has actually had ME for over 20 years. Um, but I think, you know, what really kicked off this journey was that, like many patients I've experienced over the last two and a half years, you know, little to no treatment, minimal support, uh, and also a, a real lack of recognition uh, for what has been a really life-changing condition. And it's been uh, alarming to me how little uh, technology or tools are available to help manage it. Um, and so over a year ago, I was well enough to start building Visible, um, which as Helen mentioned, is a digital platform designed specifically to help people with long COVID um, and MECFS. Uh, so back in March last year, uh, we actually raised a substantial amount of funding from uh, health tech investors around the world. Uh, and we got to bring together some of the leading researchers in the space uh, so you'll recognize a few names in here, um, and you'll see that some of these names are from uh, the US, uh, but also from Europe. Um, and there are some people that are newer to this space, like David Petrino, and then some who have been researching uh, these conditions for decades, uh, like Todd and Suzanne. Uh, so we're, we're really keen to be working closely with research institutions, and actually uh, something I'll speak about a little bit further in. Um, we'll be announcing a few of these partnerships uh, going forwards, but I think it's really important to say we are really keen to align ourselves with researchers uh, as much as possible. Um, and that really is because our mission at Visible is to um, help us better understand these conditions. So you know, help patients better understand their conditions so that they can, they can better manage it, help researchers understand these conditions so that we can move forward to treatments that we badly need. Um, and then also help carers understand it, uh, these conditions so they, they can better guide patients. Um, and, you know, one more thing I'll add is that, you know, I'm not the only one on the team with lived experience, actually over half us either have long COVID or ME. So we are really motivated by uh, the research side of it. Um, and I'll get into that in a bit more detail. Um, so what do we do at Visible? We use wearable technology to help patients measure and manage uh, their condition. Uh, and we do this a few ways. So we help patients to manage their activity and um, to avoid crashes. 
um, also help them track the trajectory of their illness in the long term uh, and then help measure the response to interventions in the short term so uh, we can work out what makes them better what makes them worse um, but really that the big emphasis on us is is moving to a world where we're using objective data so rather than the self-reported symptoms relying on biometrics and, and as we all know here that one of the reasons that these conditions aren't taken as serious they should be is really a lack of a biomarker so trying to trying to find hard numbers to, to place against these against these conditions is something that we're really uh, excited about so a quick overview of visible there are actually two parts to our platform so we have this free app that doesn't use wearable data and then we have visible plus uh, where we do use wearable data so that's the sort of delineation between the two and the free app is actually already available on the app store we have had over 25,000 people join since we launched visible in uh, beta uh, back in november which is really a staggering amount at this early stage um, and the free app is really designed to help you measure your body signals in the morning uh, track your symptoms in the evening uh, spot trends and patterns in your condition and we can do quite a lot of this without the wearable it is quite manual but you are able to get some of the value there um, and then we have the wearable subscription where we use wearable data to help patients manage their activity um, and also measure their condition and i'll talk about a bit more about this um, so we're currently testing visible plus with a couple of hundred beta testers in what we're calling our early access program but the the goal is to have this more widely available yeah, in the coming months uh, so I'm just going to run through in a little bit more detail um, how it all works. So uh, for our, um, we gather um, data via check-in. So we have both a morning and an evening check-in. And your morning check-in is where we capture your some of your biometrics. So actually using your finger on your smartphone, the camera sensor can pick up small changes in the color of your finger fingertip. And it can translate that into beats. And then from that, we can get things like your resting heart rate, and we can also get your heart rate variability. And these are really key indicators of your, your health and the health of your nervous system. Um, so uh, heart rate variability, there's been some early studies on this that show that it is correlated with uh, your health and also with fatigue and ME. And so it is a really accessible biomarker that we can use and again moving away from that sort of self-report like how am i feeling today but actually putting a hard number against it um so uh, you can use it to look at your heart rate variability compared to your recent baseline to see how are you doing today versus um, previous months uh, and then uh, once you've taken these biometrics we try and, um, and do a lot of the interpretation for you for what that means and so we have this thing that we call a morning stability score that takes into account your heart rate variability, your resting heart rate, your sleep quality, uh, and your symptoms. Um, and we compare that against your baseline and we give you a score to, to show you how you are doing today uh, versus uh, the last 90 days. And then in the evening, we capture this self-reported data. So uh, we ask you how um, were your symptoms today at their worst, um, but we also capture things like treatment, uh, exertion, so not just physical, but cognitive and emotional. Um, and then for, um, for those that have periods, the menstrual cycle is a really, has a really big impact on symptoms. So being able to pass that um, away from the physical exertion, which may cause, or the cognitive or emotional exertion that may cause symptom flare-ups, you're able to see what could be the trigger. Uh, and then we have our trends tab where you're able to compare uh, your or spot trends in your condition. And you're also able to compare that against other variables. So you can see um, how your exertion, for example, uh, compares against your fatigue. Uh, and then the idea is then you're able to also share this with, uh, with your doctor, with clinicians. Um, but one thing we're also really excited about is being able to share this with researchers too. So we have um, a couple of academic partnerships, which we're going to be announcing in the next couple of months. Um, but our first one that I can talk about is with Imperial College London. And because you'll already be tracking, you can already track this, uh, your condition for yourself, there's also the ability for you to be able to share that data directly with the research. So a simple opt-in button, and you can share it anonymously uh, with a researcher. And then uh, Vicky Mayo, Dr. Vicky Mayo from Imperial College is going to look at 
um, people with ME and long COVID and see what the impact uh, the menstrual cycle has on these conditions. And it's a really incredible opportunity for us to use this data to bring visibility to these conditions. So I think it's a, an issue that, for example, we all know is uh, happening in the, in the community and for it to be in, uh, published in peer-reviewed papers is, um, is a really exciting opportunity. Um, so as I mentioned, it's currently free to download. I know we have some international people uh, and right now uh, it's available in the US, the UK and Germany. And we are looking to expand that as much as possible. And it's really just limited by the resources we have as a, as a small team right now. And then we have Visible Plus, which we're aiming to launch widely this summer. And this is what we're really excited about. And really the reason that we built Visible was to be able to make your illness visible uh, via wearable data. Um, so we use high accuracy research grade um, data from a device called the Polar Verity Sense. Um, and this actually comes in a starter pack uh, to get you going and it connects directly with the visible app. And what that allows us to do is give you real time guidance on when to slow down. So we can send you notifications when you're crossing your anaerobic threshold or your overexertion zone. Uh, so yeah, this is a, based on a lot of work done out of the Workwell Foundation, um, which shows that by staying within your aerobic zone, so for example, below sort of 120 beats per minute, 110 beats per minute, uh, then you're able to reduce the chances of symptom flare-ups. Uh, and we right now have this all uh, customizable. In the future, we'll calibrate it per person. Um, and we split up these zones. We have three zones that um, you, depending on your heart rate, you will be in. And these are either your rest, your exertion, or your overexertion. And then you're able to set alerts uh, when you're in your overexertion zone. Uh, and then you can also measure your exertion with what we call pace points. Uh, so this is where we use your cumulative heart rate throughout the day to generate points and you collect more points if you are in one of the higher zones. So particularly if you're in the overexertion zone, uh, you'll collect four times more points, for example, than if you are in the exertion zone. And using this to allow you to pace your day and not, not so much restrict your activity, but to try and help you balance it. Uh, and so you can set a budget for pace points for the whole day, and then you can try and stay below it. And sort of similar to the banking apps where you're trying to control your monthly expenditure, you don't want to go over your budget, we do the same here. And we actually have this thing that we call a pace setter. It moves slowly around um, this donut here and your pace points will fill up and you're able to see, am I in front or am I behind my pace setter? And it gives you a good opportunity during the day to be able to see if you need to slow down or if you've got a little bit more capacity for, uh, for activity. And then we have, uh, you know, I've talked so far about managing these conditions, but uh, I think more excitingly is uh, actually being able to measure them as well. Uh, so we are developing two what we call digital biomarkers. So these are metrics that are very relevant to these conditions. So for example, time spent upright, uh, particularly for those that have POTS is a really um, important metric. And the um, Bateman Horn Center um, is a really big advocate of this metric because it correlates really closely with your illness severity. Uh, so you're able to see over time, are you spending more time upright um, or are you, you know, spending more time lying down? Um, and also one of the amazing things that we can do is also translate that time lying down into crashes so we can better understand what causing those symptom flare-ups. And this is all on our roadmap right now. Um, it's not currently available, but it's something that we're working on in the background as we collect more data. Uh, and then we have uh, the ability as well to measure your orthostatic intolerance. Uh, so, uh, you know, for this autonomic nervous system dysfunction that we see in these conditions and you know, not just long COVID, ME, but, you know, fibromyalgia, chronic Lyme, is that, you know, you can pick this up in a tilt table test or even a, a NASA lean test. You know, when you move your body from lying down to standing up, this a regular response in your blood, blood pressure and your heart rate. Well, you can actually pick that up in wearable data because you're essentially doing that multiple times throughout the day. Um, and this allows us to give you a number each day that shows you, um, you know, how, what your static intolerance is, is like um, compared to recent days. And then again, I'll help you answer those questions about your condition. You know, what's making you better? What's making you worse? Um, you know, are you getting better um, in the long term? So that's a sort of short run through of uh, the visible 
platform and yeah happy to jump into any questions and yeah how and let me know what what, what happens next Sorry, I just realized I was muted. Um, so you can stop sharing your screen and we can start the discussion. Um, so we do have some questions from the chat and thank you so much for your presentation to fill us in more on where the app is at. Um, I wanted to start out with a question um, for myself. I know you introduced the wearable device that partners with the prime version of the app. Um, you are one of other technologies that are, or I guess apps, uh, platforms that are pairing with how to sync up like the, yeah. uh, you know, using the uh, photo and things like that of the skin. Do you know um, some of the details of how this is different or might be the same across other devices that exist? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, you know, a lot of what we're doing in these early days is reframing a lot of the data that these other devices already offer. So. Uh, for example, you know, this, the ability to measure your heart rate variability is available in things like your aura ring or like a whoop or a Fitbit, um, mm. but it's always done in the context of fitness. So on the sort of spectrum of fitness, wellness, illness, uh, that's where we're coming at it from, from the illness perspective and the ability to like layer on your symptoms is not something that the other um, apps are able to do. And then in the longer term, it's building out that other functionality that is more specific to these conditions. So um, like the pacing guidance actually requires um, uh, quite a bit of work for us to do on the back end in the technology because you actually have to stream the data directly from the device to the app to then be able to provide the notifications. Um, and this is something that devices on the market can do um, intermittently. Sometimes you have to manually put it into exercise mode, which isn't that appropriate for these conditions. Um, yeah. So there's definitely limitations to other devices out there. Um, but certainly as we get further into developing visible, um, once we start building out these digital biomarkers, I think that's when there will be an even clearer uh, difference between what's on the market and what, what we're building. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think now, as we have some questions coming in, we're gonna open it up uh, to people from the audience. And just to remind people, if you can type them in the chat, uh, we're gonna try to take as many as we can. Um, so one of the first questions we have um, is if you could describe the difficulty or transition from the free app to the paid subscription, maybe like what features um, would people have to change what they're inputting? Um, so actually, it's not a big change. Anyone that's used to using the free app, it's a very easy transition into um, into the into plus. Uh, what we we just add an extra segment on top of the morning and the evening check in, which still exists, and that really all the pacing features sit around. Okay. Now the, the morning check in currently for the free app, you do that with your with your fingerprint, with your fingertip, um, and with Plus, we actually take that data and we'll be um, actually launching this in the next week. Uh, the ability to take it uh, from the device itself. Okay. Uh, so one of the other questions we have is, um, I think, relating to the pacing points and what symptoms you yeah. can include or rate. Does exertion include any cognitive or like emotional rather than just physical dimensions? So just physical, although I would say, I think it's been interesting for us, the further into this that we've got is that we do see raised, because the polar device is so accurate, you do see things like conversations, um, uh, like this cognitive exertion, uh, this emotional exertion starting to appear, appear in the data. Um, you know, it's not quite as obvious as the physical exertion, but it is there. And so we do see some pace points being collected during those activities. Uh, and certainly like the further into this we get, the idea is to be able to really pick up on that stuff so that we don't have to use sort of physical measures via the wearable led on with self-reported cognitive and emotional questions that we ask in the evening check-in. So that's definitely the goal was to get there. And we've seen the early signs that actually we can use the wearable data to be able to do that. Okay. Um, one of our other questions is from someone who is uh, writing in from New Hampshire asking um, that I'm sure I signed up to be in the beta testing for Visible Plus, yeah. but I had not been aware the space had started. Um, they're asking, is that only in the UK so far? It, it is. Okay. Uh, so yeah, if you can tell from the accent, we are currently headquartered in London. And so it's just much easier for us to be able to um, send out devices, be able to respond to people's issues um, when we're in the same country. But 
Uh, absolutely, like our next batch that we're sending out will be in the US. So if you are in the US and you're on the wait list, you can expect to get a uh, message via the app in the next couple of weeks inviting you to join the early access program if you want to. Awesome. Um, so this person had also asked if the visible app, if it tracks oxygen saturation and can sensory stimulation such as loud noise be measured? And is there any correlation to the heart rate variability or just heart rate measure? So uh, it's really interesting. So there's, there are obviously different data streams that are available to us. The most obvious and the most accessible for us, accessible to us uh, to be able to monitor your autonomic nervous system is through your heart rate variability and your heart rate. But there are other, there are other data streams in the future we would like to include. And so the ability for you to opt in to be able to for example, be able to um, allow the visible app to be able to hear like how loud noises are so that we can take that into account. Maybe we can understand when you're undergoing more social exertion. Uh, we can take into account your location and therefore the weather so we can see for people who have issues with uh, pressure. So there are uh, there is sort of no end in different data streams that we can plug into. <laughs> And really what we're, what we're doing is we're starting with the ones that have the highest signal and the most accessible. And then the further into building out a visible platform, the more data streams that we'll include. And I think that's really important to add is that it's we're, this is a multi-year project with visible. Like we're gonna keep iterating, we're gonna keep building, we're gonna keep improving it. And even what visible looks like right now it might look very different in a few months time uh, and hopefully uh, with the help of the whole community it will only be better. That makes a lot of sense as well. Um, so one of our other questions here is asking why is heart rate variability on its own such a good measure um, and secondly kind of paired with that um, are there any plans for the visible app to integrate with different wearable devices maybe things that come from yeah. um, Apple Health um, other things like yeah. that. Yeah so to answer the first question HRV, so heart rate variability, is a lot more sensitive than your resting heart rate and picking up issues or um, signals from your autonomic nervous system. So your resting heart rate is still really good. And we do see pretty consistently across the data that, for example, when people are in crashes, we do see an increased um, resting heart rate alongside like a decreased heart rate variability. That's quite general, but that we do see that. Um, so those two together, uh, are, are very powerful. Um, so yeah, we, we we use both of them and you'll see in the morning stability score that we we generate, we we use both those signals. Um, on the wearables that we're integrating with, it's something that we talk about a lot as a team is how do we make visible more accessible to, to everyone? And we've got to balance that with making sure that we're really um, using the best data possible um, and that we're really taking like these conditions really seriously because you know we don't think actually that the Fitbits provide the accuracy um, you need to really be able to manage these conditions properly. Um, and so we, in these very early stages where we want to build the best technology possible, uh, one of the compromises we've had to make is to choose one device and to integrate with that um, and all the sort of uh, the flexibility it gives and us being able to get that raw data and be able to look at it really closely. It's also great for the researchers. It does, it, I understand the frustration in um, us not being able to integrate with other devices right now. Um, and there are some limitations there that are, are difficult to explain, but I guess the nice thing about this forum is that maybe I could spend like a, a minute explaining about some of the limitations to integrating with it, with it for example, an Apple Watch. So um, you can't, with the Apple Watch or some of the other devices, you have to manually set it to stream the data real time to the app. So you're having to go in and set it to yoga mode, which is not, or whatever whatever exercise you want to set it to, which is not great. Um, and it doesn't stay in that. And we really need it to stay in that the whole time. So you're not going back and forth and, and tapping on buttons. Because if you do, if you're outside of that mode, you actually, we actually get the data too late to be able to tell you when to slow down. And so to actually be able to do real time guidance, we have to work with um, a specific manufacturer and we're partnered with Polar for now that is um, to be able to get that. But de definitely on our roadmap is something we're thinking about and the Apple Watch is the obvious one for us to integrate with next. That makes a lot of sense, especially for uh, what you're saying, the research component to kind of yeah. have one universal uh, tracking that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, um, I, and I think, you know, to give a bit more context around that, like one of the ways that we think about what we're building uh, visible is, you know, you look in the, at the diabetes space or another chronic illness where measuring and managing your glucose levels is really important. And they are the best, the best technology in the world exists in that space to be able to do it. And really what we're looking at doing with visible is the same thing. Um, and so instead of measuring and managing your glucose levels, you're measuring and managing your activity levels and your autonomic nervous system. I like that you're setting a high bar for it and it's nice to have something yeah. to look forward to, to know the investment of making something that works really well. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, this from the Solve ME, but someone had asked in our chat, um, how does this kind of how, what symptoms you select relate to uh, Solve ME's you and me symptom tracking? Yes, yeah, so uh, that's something that I can chat about in possibly the next couple of months is um, we are talking with Solbemi and um, seeing if we can help them uh, in their mission and help support them on the You and Me project. Um, and I hope that we can talk more openly and publicly about it in, in the next few months. We'll see um, where things go, but it's definitely something that we're um, keen to be involved with. That's awesome to hear. Okay, well, we will be yeah. kept posted. Um, so one of our other questions from the chat is asking, um, have you had any direct feedback or ratings on how helpful the user experience is for people with ME or long COVID who are users? Um, we, we definitely have had a lot of feedback. We, and we're really keen to build this with the community. I, you know, I mentioned that half our team have either long COVID or ME, but in a condition that has 200 plus symptoms actually like even between the, the the team we're really not able to cover everyone's experiences and so you know, trying to build something that works for as many people as possible has been really important for us and it's definitely been some of the hardest decisions we've had to make is um you know when do we say no to certain features that people are requesting because we do want to keep it simple and effective because we know you know a large majority of people have cognitive dysfunction so we we do listen a lot and we are always trying to um, make small changes wherever we can um, to improve uh, the experience. And uh, if anyone does use the app, we have a section called the help and feedback section. You can tap on it and you can chat directly with the team and we will always respond within 24 hours. Uh, so uh, we're, yeah, could, can definitely really keen for more feedback. It only makes it better. That's great. Um, a couple of questions that have been repeating, I think from members are wondering um, what the cost or is there like a membership fee for the prime version? Yeah, so we haven't announced the cost yet for um, what plus will be when it's widely available, but I suspect it looks like it will be somewhere in the, in the ballpark of other digital subscriptions. So like your Netflix or something like that. Mm, okay. So would uh, like, a, uh, I guess like a monthly subscription then probably? Yes, yeah. Gotcha. Um, someone had also asked, um, will Canada be a part of the Visible Plus beta version? Um, good question. It's, it won't be, but it, but we are trying to, we're trying to support as many countries as we can. Sure. Um, so this one is not a question, but a really nice comment um, from Terry saying, hello, Harry. I want to let you know I've been using your app and thank you for this. I'm so looking forward to the Plus app as I see some other features that the free doesn't address, such as the alert when your anaerobic threshold has been passed. So I always like to have some yeah. thank yous. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And I think that's what we've, you know, we, we've, we've done a lot of surveys in the community asking, you know, what are the most important uh, features, um, you know, things that uh, people want to see. And really those like real time alerts are up there with some of the most important uh, a long time alongside these metrics, you know, uptime um, or static intolerance. So uh, those those two, the digital biomarkers and um, the management side of it are the two that we're really focused now on Visible Plus building out. Mm -hmm. um, I think similar to some of the other versions, um, someone is asking, will you be able to download your the personal data? And if so, what format might that look like? Yes, so if anyone is using the app, they might be a little bit frustrated that right now you can't export your data. Um, and that is purely because uh, just for a, a lack of resources on our side that we just haven't had the time. I think we have been quite taken aback at how many people have joined uh, the platform in the last uh, few months. And so uh, unfortunately that feature just kept, keeps getting bumped down the, um, 
down our, our, our long backlog of things to, to build. But we, you know, we, I, th I think it's important to say, you know, we have no intention of, you know, holding it. Like we want it to be available back to anyone who wants to use it. And so uh, we are going to build out both a PDF export. So I showed in the slides, there's, we haven't even done the designs for it um, to be able to export and share that with your clinician. And we also have a CSV. Um, so for the more technically minded, the ability to export, like import that into your Excel and then, and then really look at your data in even more detail. Um, and if you and if you are interested in the CSV side of it, um, definitely, you know, message the team that you're interested in that, um, because also we'd be really interested in what you would like to see in the data that we're not showing in the um, in the app itself, because that's really interesting to us, because maybe it's something that we can we can actually build. Sure. Yeah, that'd be nice yeah. to have the feedback. Yeah. Um, so one other question was asking um, in terms of the heart rate variability, how effective is a one time daily reading um, in the current app? Uh, how or sorry, how effective is it at predicting someone's symptoms or readiness compared to like a continuous monitoring of the heart rate variability? Yeah, so those single time points um, checks that we do every that we recommend every morning are really good for you're in a controlled environment like um, we mentioned the heart rate variability is really sensitive and so taking it every morning in a very controlled environment in the same position at roughly the same time gives you a really nice um consistent data that you can then see over time and actually looking backwards it's actually almost more helpful rather than using it as a predictor going forwards and being able to see um how your condition fluctuates um so was that was that the question? I, the brain fog got the better of me there. Yeah, no, I think that's summing up more just yeah. like um, exactly yeah, how is it used and in yes. what I think you're yeah because so. uh, sure because uh, some people have asked if we can do um, the morning check in multiple times throughout the day um, to get an indication on, on that condition, and we haven't done that in the free app because we don't think it's a very good process. Like sitting there for sixty seconds, like it's fine to do it once a day, but. Uh, one of the things that we think about when we're building out visible is like how we don't, none of us want to have to think about our illness more than we have to. So we've like purposely built a framework that tries to limit that as much as possible. So it's at one minute in the morning and it's 30 seconds in the evening. And then once you get the wearable involved, you actually eventually won't have to do the morning check-in either. Um, and so trying to move as much as what we do to passive tracking um, and to be able to Give you the guidance without you having to think too much about it and telling you stuff at the right time without you having to go back and check the app that's the sort of the vision and, and the end goal is to get there uh, so as we move to plus there is uh, the opportunity for us to essentially build out what is a morning stability score that is always available throughout the day um, so that you can check in not dissimilar to what garmin does with the body body battery Okay, so I think the answer is we did have another question, um, kind of clarifying that the polar allows you to ongoingly collect data without interruption. Then, would that yes, be yeah, 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 yeah. So the yes, so you can do the morning check in with it, where you get you, where you're doing that specifically telling the app, you know, I'm doing my morning check in. This is when the controlled environment I'm doing it within, um, and then we're able to get data throughout the day as well. Okay. Um, someone else had a question, I think more with the specifics of the pacing number, I think like the donut shape you had. Yes, our pace about. points, yeah. Yeah, so they're wondering, is it like out of 100 or does it go up to a certain number? And um, I guess more like what is the currency of the numbers and how they work? Yes, so the numbers are based on your, um, on your cumulative heart rate throughout the day. And then we apply a multiple to that depending on what zone you're in. So if you're in the rest zone, we actually don't, doesn't build up any pace points. If you're in your exertion zone, we'll build up some pace points. And if you're in the overexertion zone, it will build up a lot. Um, and so it doesn't actually, you you could uh, rack up, you can rack up quite a lot of pace points if you were to have your heart rate, uh, you know, 180 beats per minute throughout the day. Um, so I think there is a, there will be a theoretical limit to it, but What's important is that we actually let you set the budget. So we essentially let you say, what do you want the scale to be out of? Um, so we have a calibration period over the first week, and we hope to automate this in time, but um, where you go about your normal activity for the first few days, and then you're able to look back and see, you know, what was your average point pace points each day? And if it didn't end up in a crash, like that's a good place to set your budget. Um, so that's how we, if that's helpful, giving a bit more color around what pace points are. That makes sense. Uh, and right now they count up. Um, and oh, okay. we're definitely interested in potentially turning them around to count down um, to stick with, you know, I guess, the spoons 
uh, theory and, and way of thinking that I know a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. um, someone else had a question that I don't think I covered in the previous ones. Um, if oxygen saturation is tracked ongoingly with the, the polar device, I guess, in that situation. Uh, so no, so the polar doesn't. But certainly in the future, that will be an opportunity for us. You know, more data is only better. And as we start moving into the world of machine learning, uh, then we can start to pick up signals in other spaces. That makes sense. Um, so a few other people had asked kind of the format of um, wearing the device as like a watch or a wristband versus the armband um, user. Does it require a connection into a watch for use, or can you go basically from that to the, I guess, phone app directly? Yeah. So right now the device sits on the upper arm, um, and you know that it's not the best uh, format, but there's there's a bit of a spectrum. You've got your chest strap, which is super accurate, but also super uncomfortable to be wearing all day. Mm -hmm. And the other end of the spectrum, you've got your wrist-based devices which have quite, because of the ligament movement, you actually get quite a lot of noise coming through. So less accurate data, but it's much more comfortable. And we've gone halfway in between with a polar device. We, we get the best of both worlds. We still get that comfort and we to be able to wear it all day. Uh, and we also get the really accurate data. Um, so that's why we've gone down that route. If you do happen to have an Apple Watch, you do actually get the notifications come through on your wrist as well. Um, but certainly as we uh, you know go, go further into our journey with visible, um, we are looking at other devices, whether that is third party devices or um, using, you know, an in house version that is much more customized to what we need. Gotcha. Um, I think similar to that note in terms of um, the, I guess, kind of noisiness of the data or not, especially with your mm -hmm. um, academic partnerships, we have some questions on. Um, do you know or do you have any plans in the future of any general practitioners working with this data to kind of be using it with their patients or any other um, places like the NHS long COVID clinics, you know, utilizing this result? Yeah, yeah so we are actually um, working with Derby Clinic um, and the University of Nottingham, um, and they have a bunch of uh, Visible Plus devices that they're using. Uh, right now, because what they're interested in is potentially you know, sending out visible to um, patients a month before they come in for an appointment and then having them then having more data on them and then being able to um, use the visible platform to help them manage it um, and, and to monitor them as well. It's quite a long process for us to go through the regulatory hurdles to be able to offer that. Um, and we're very I guess, you know, we're, we're aware how little there is out there for patients right now. So going directly to everyone is our first port call. And then, you know, once we've really built something that is useful to everyone and that everyone uh, enjoys using, then we'll turn our attention to the clinics as well. Um, but yeah, you know, we, you'll have seen from the slides, both you know, Todd um, Davenport uh, at the Workwell Foundation and his clinic and David Petrino at Mount Sinai Health, you know, these are discussions that are happening in the background is how can we integrate visible in the healthcare system uh, alongside. So that, that is part of the bigger vision. And I, I guess it gives me a nice opportunity as well to talk about cost, which is the, you know, we want to make visible available right now. The downside is, is that because we're going direct to patients, like there is a cost associated with that. The long-term vision you know, for those in the UK, for example, the NHS, I think should pay, should cover the costs of, of the platform. Um, and I'm slowly learning how the US healthcare system works. Um, although I'd be told not many Americans know either. So um, that is correct. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we need to figure out as well how we can get that covered by insurance. Well, it's really exciting to hear more the longitudinal goals of that, yeah. especially in, in the UK then. Um, in terms of the app, we have a couple questions relating to um, if it uses any machine learning in terms of the, I guess, predictability parts. Yeah, so we have used um, machine learning, some basic machine learning in our second, third iteration of the Morning Stability School, and we actually have another version that's coming out next week. Um, so it's something that we're going to keep iterating on. And as we get more data and as we have more resources, we're able to make more accurate predictions. So yes, it is something that we have the capability of doing and that capability is only growing you know, the further into the project that we get. 
Awesome. Uh, we also had some questions relating to uh, if there's any ETA on when the plus version might be available. Uh, so uh, where are we at right now? We've got a couple of hundred people testing it in the UK, um, and we'll be expanding that um, in the next couple of weeks for the UK and then the US straight afterwards. And then really it depends on the feedback from users. Like it's important, you know, especially if we have to charge for it, that we are really building something that is really helpful and it is working and doesn't have any bugs. I think, you know, with the free app, those of you that have used it will know that we have been on a bit of a journey with it in terms of how we've built it, we've changed things around, there's been bugs, there's been issues, but you know, it has been free. So I think everyone's been quite understanding of, of that. Um, but as we get into the next phase, um, I think it's really important that we are really, but we really make sure that it is something that is really useful to people before we make it more widely available. That makes a lot of sense as well. Um, in terms of maybe future plans, someone is also asking, um, is it or will it track uh, sleep quality at all? So not in this initial version, it won't. We're very focused on understanding uh, like waking hour activity uh, mm -hmm. and using that to predict symptom flare ups, but totally understand that like disruptive sleep is a huge part of these conditions. Um, I mean, we one of the one of the great things about doing the morning check-in is that actually you do get a lot of the data from the sleep in that sixty-second reading because we can understand how well recovered your body is after a night's sleep. So if you've had a terrible night's sleep, we can actually see it. So while you know we aren't tracking what stages of sleep, we are getting the like high-level most important thing, which is like when you wake up in the morning, how is your body doing? Okay. Um, in terms of it, yeah, being tailored to the ME and like long COVID symptoms, um, someone is also asking for the heart rate variability, could that work to predict um, any kind of AFib relation uh, heart issues? Or I guess maybe is there any other umbrella that these symptoms would kind of counteract? Yeah, uh, you know, we have to be careful right now in the what we're building is, you know, we for, for us to be able to detect AFib, there's certain uh, like medical regulatory approvals that we have to go down. So it's not something that we would be able to, to claim that we can do or will be trying to do for the next um, six months to a year. Um, but after that, it would make total sense that we would have that kind of ability in the future, but mm. it's not something we're focused on right now. Okay. Yeah. So if you've got an Apple Watch, that's still worth having. Yeah. Uh, someone else had also asked if, uh, basic anaerobic alerts will become available in the free app at some point, um, bringing up the issue that the subscription costs can be a challenge for those on disability with limited funds. Yes. So the, um, I think on my the third slide, so the, the delineation is between free and plus is whether there's wearable data or not. So um, we're not bringing wearable data into the free app. And so we won't be able to do the anaerobic threshold because of that if that answers the question and and again like i totally and it is like absolutely one of the most painful things about building visible is um is is around the cost and it is we you know we can't not i mean the the we we, we are fortunate in a sense that we've got some a good amount of funding to start with and we'll be able to bring on some like really talented data scientists to work with us um, but you know, we want to be able to sustain visible over the long term. And uh, you know, for us, this is you know a five, 10 year project. We're really in this for the I'm not gonna say the long haul, um, but uh, for the long term. Uh and uh totally get the 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 a lot of people with these conditions don't have the aren't in a financial situation to be able to afford them. And that is why we're working really hard with the clinics. You know, we're talking to you know, Manhattan Sinai Health System, we're talking to, um, you know, uh, Todd Davenport and his clinic about, you know, how how can we, how can we essentially offer Visible Plus for free because that is the, the long-term aim. I think it is something that insurers should have to pay in the UK, the NHS. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other questions that I think you um, did touch on in terms of the user input from your board members being people who struggle with these symptoms themselves, um, asking, uh, about the operation of the app in terms of brain fog, you know, not making yep. it difficult. Could you speak to some of the, I guess, interplay of how those influenced the actual interface of the app? Yeah, really, really good question. It's, it's like from a product perspective, which is 
and, and design perspective it's been like a real challenge because like i mentioned like these conditions are so different for so many people and it would be um really easy for us to just keep adding features and you know someone's requesting this thing and then okay let's build that and this and quickly it becomes quite a bloated complicated app for the first time user that's coming in and so we've really tried very hard to make visible as simple as it as possible and that comes down to things like the uh the rating system for the symptoms and so you know we have had quite a lot of requests for more detail on that so you know can we make it out of 10 can you make it out of 100 rather than out of four one of the ways that we've thought about it is that you you I, i'm not sure you can really tell whether you're a seven or an eight I think you I think you can quite confidently tell if out of a four whether you're a two or a three. And so trying to reduce the thinking and that like sort of choice paralysis as much as possible to make it really easy um, was like an example of one of the um, decisions that we came to around how can we keep visible really simple to use. The other decision that we we had around keeping it really simple was these morning and the evening check-ins. So I mentioned that people would ask for like multiple check-ins throughout the day. But again, our thinking behind that is that if you are trying to help understand your condition, actually recording stuff multiple times throughout the day doesn't make as much sense because actually what you what you really what these apps are really good for is trying to solve these longer feedback loops. So, you know, particularly with post-exertion malaise, you do something today, you suddenly feel tor terrible tomorrow. And it's like how you you that you sort of lose that connection between the input and the output. And so if there is a um if there is a trigger that happens and then two hours later you feel worse actually you you can kind of connect the dots there quite easily and so um you know, just recording daily once twice daily is really enough to be able to capture those bigger changes in time uh, bigger time period changes um if that makes sense mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to share another thank you in the comments from Julie, uh, kind of related to what you're talking about now, saying, I love how my husband can ask me, what number are you today? And it can really help him understand better. And thank you for this, Harry, she says. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I think that's like, it's the power of objective data. I think it's such a, uh, the question that uh, at least I hate getting asked is like, how are you doing today? Um, and to be able to offer numbers uh, that are based in you know, your biometrics is is really powerful. And uh, certainly in the future, we're looking at being able to make those numbers easier to share. So easy to share with other people that have, have the visible app, but also easier to share with your carers as well. Uh, That's a really because, exciting idea. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think it comes down to why we call it visible. It's using this data, you know, not just to make it visible to yourself, but the people around you as well. Um, I think, so we're approaching five o'clock, but I think we can fit in um, this as our last question. Um, someone asked, I know you said the pacing is also kind of self-budgeted, but asking, yeah. are you planning on conducting or publishing any studies testing kind of the accuracy or efficacy of the app and those predictions? Yes. Yeah, so we already have a study with the University of Liverpool that's happening in the UK. Um, well, is that, that's a feasibility study around comparing visible to um, so using the visible platform, also uh, an arm that's using, uh, I think, Fitbits and an arm that is uh, not using anything. And we definitely, you know, research is like very much at the core of what we're doing. And yeah, uh, hoping to get as much of this into published research. Um, I think it will only help uh, move things forwards. And I, I think if uh, we can move the research forwards even by a day, I think we will and be really proud of what we've done. That's really exciting to hear. Um, and I think we're going to wrap up. We just have a lot of thank yous in the comments that I want to convey to you. Um, thank you. And, and if anyone does have any more questions, um, you know, you can always email me, harry at uh, makevisible.com. Like, we're really keen to be really um, open about what we're doing. So I'm happy to, happy to answer any, any questions. Thank you for being, being willing to do that, Harry. And I wanted to thank you for kind of being willing to answer all these questions on such an important topic. And uh, kind of like you mentioned, there's more and more people and patients dealing with these symptoms. Uh, to, so to have something that can be characterizing and kind of predicting symptoms and as well as all of the research end, 
um, that's really exciting to hear more about the longer term plans of where this is going to go. So thank you for sharing with us. Oh, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to just announcing what our next event is. If you're able to show um, the last two slides of that other presentation. Yes. So um, as we had said, this is our fifth of the month and we offer one on every third Sunday. Um, so just as a reminder, the recording of this session is going to be available and posted to the Mass ME YouTube channel as soon as we can. And uh, if you've registered, you'll get an email when the recording is up. And we encourage you to please share the video with your fan, family, friends, and anyone on social media that you would like. Um, and we have, yeah, a lot more thank yous. Awesome. So thank you, Harry. And this is just our little preview of what's going to be happening next month on Sunday, June 18th. So our next Sunday conversation will also be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And our special topic uh, is a little different from what we normally do, titled Zoom Through 40 Years of MECFS with Mass ME, a flyby look at four decades of change and finally some progress. Uh, we hope you'll join us and take a look at the past 40 years and get ready for where the future is headed. And if you could just go to the next slide, Harry. Um, we found, uh, if you have found this program worthwhile, there are ways that you can help and you can make a donation to support this series in particular by donating online at this website listed there, massmecfs.org slash donate. And on the same page, you can sign up for the Mass ME newsletter. And if you donate $25 or more and check the option to become a member, uh, that will establish your membership or renew it and you will be invited to members only programs. So I want to thank you all again for coming. Thank you, Harry, for presenting. And I hope that we'll see you all again next month. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Harry.